I don't review goals until my goals are accomplished. I have a rule for myself with everything I do, right? If I say it out loud, it's a contract. If it goes on a to-do list, it's gonna get done. This is a nonsensical question to me. Like, when do you wanna review your goals? After your goals are accomplished, then set some new ones. What does it take to do the impossible? What does it take? Does it take to level up your game like never before? What does it take for individuals, organizations, for even institutions to achieve paradigm shifting? Nothing is ever the same again. Breakthroughs. Our mission is to decode the neurobiology of flow and cognitive peak performance. Access the minds of maverick scientists, groundbreaking innovators, and world-leading experts to understand what it takes to achieve ultimate human performance. So you can feel your best, perform your best, and accomplish your boldest goals. I'm your host, Rian Doris, and together with best-selling author Stephen Kotler, I present to you Flow Research Collective Radio. Huge welcome, everybody, to the to the science goal setting with with Stephen Cutler and Dr. Brent Hogarth here. So the goal for today is really to talk about how to set goals, to talk about why they're important, and then to go into common pitfalls to avoid when trying to actually achieve the goals that you set. And I think it's great timing for this call for you know a number of big reasons. Firstly, 2020 was a wild ride. For many of us in 2021, given that it's still early January, is still a blank canvas. So locking in your goals early in the year, which we're going to try and help you with today, is really an extremely valuable thing to do. And the second reason it's good timing is that Stephen's new book, The Art of Impossible, comes out on Tuesday, January 19th. And we're going to be talking about The Art of Impossible throughout the crowdcast today. But just know for now that The Art of Impossible is the ultimate peak performance manual when it comes to goal setting and goal achieving as well. So big welcome to Stephen Kotler, big welcome to Dr. Brent Hogarth, who's going to be the, the co-host for today and also share his expertise and thoughts on the topic. So Stephen, I want to begin just by touching on your MTPs, the ones you mentioned in the book. So you say that you've got three MTPs, write books that have a deep impact, advance the science and training of peak performance and make the world a better place for animals. And that those three goals basically function as the mission statement for your life. Can you tell us how you ended up arriving at those three goals that are so clear and can be summarized in you know just a couple of sentences? I am so really reticent to talk about, I, I know everybody loves to talk about their massively transformative purposes today's world and I'm really so reticent. I was really reticent to share it in the book, um, in fact, but I just thought it was useful. Um, the, but the truth of the matter is how I came to them. First, I don't ever try to fight my own biology or who I am. So the first thing I did is I audited my life. What have I like worked the hardest towards consistently over and over and over and over and again and again? And those have been the things, right? That's one, you know what I mean? Like I like to let my experience guide sorts of my decision making. So the first thing I looked at is every morning, no matter what, I get up and I start writing. And if I don't get to get up and start writing, I get pissed off. And, you know, the goal for that, the end result of those books is, you know, have a solid impact in the world. And so that one was self-explanatory. It was, it was that sort of thing. And it was just a one, you know, uh, having the mission level goals for your life is it's enormous steering, right? We're goal directed machines. We don't live in reality. We live in a reality that is predominantly shaped by our fears and our goals. Those are two big filters on perception. And as goal directed systems, the system wants it goes where we look, it goes where you put it in a sense. And if you don't have those mission level goals, it doesn't there's not a focus for your life is how I sort of came to them and thought about them. But as you know, and I think I talk about that a little bit in the art of impossible, those goals also serve as my first filter for my life. Right. And um, which I think is one of the real advantages to mission level goals is that they tell you what you say yes to and what you say no to. 
um, in a really kind of broad swatch because so much opportunity and possibility comes our way, um, especially if we're living high flow lifestyles, for sure. There's always something exciting, something new, something wild. Some, oh, this cool tangent, I could go over here for a while. That's very common, especially for peak performers, for uh, that's something that comes up. So you need that filter on top that says, look, this is this is my time because this is what I'm here to do. And, you know, maybe this is something better left to other people. Mm. Yeah, it makes sense. And then funnily enough, I, I was kind of hoping you'd tee up the next question a little bit with that one, which is why why do you recommend in general to not talk about goals? And I, I know it's, one of your favorite quotes is have a passion, have a purpose, keep it to your damn self. So yeah, if you can break down the rationale behind that, I think that'd be great. So I think I think it's two or threefold. One is that when goal when when we first uh, when Gary Latham and John Locke, sort of the godfathers of goal setting theory, sort of pioneered that work, and mostly until I want to say the early two thousands, the general belief in psychology was talk about your goals, set goals, tell the world, talk about them out loud, public accountability. If you don't reach your goals, you'll be shamed. All that stuff um, really seemed to play a role. And there, and there may, by the way, there may be people where that is enough of a, a weight that it, that still really works for them. But what the research shows is when you talk about your goals, it releases the dopamine the reward chemical that it's supposed to be saved for the risk taking that leads towards you seeking your goals. And if you already get the reward chemicals for talking about your goals out loud, you literally will not have neurobiologically the motivation you need to get in the game and go after your goals is first and foremost. And the second reason is just observing what I've noticed in my own life and other people's lives. There's a, you know, there's a hit saying in hip hop, real bad boys move in silence. And that saying talks about the fact that like real bad guys do move in, bad boys do move in silence, bad girls as well. People who get it done, that seems to be fairly consistent. And one of the reasons I say, uh, have a passion for purpose, keep it to your damn self is, I think people know this intrinsically. And when you, I, and these days when I hear people talking about their kind of their passion, their purpose. I think, oh, they're talking about it. They're actually not getting after it. I don't believe them. So those are some of the thinking around it. Uh, Steven, you know, it's one thing to, to set your, an MTP or these high overarching purpose goals. I'm wondering how you develop hope. And, you know, you've you shared your story in, in some of your books and, and podcasts that I've listened to, which was a challenging upbringing. And, you know, hope is something that can be learned. And there's this interesting field of possibility development that I've kind of been exploring more and more. So they say that hope helps us increase our willingness to identify obstacles and develop, you know, more alternative solutions to ultimately accomplish that uh, high end MTP. So how what was your process of developing hope and how is that kind of come forward to maybe even this current culture we're in now of COVID and, and whatnot? That's an interesting question. I like this research because I think hope is a really, like it's a sneaky drug. It works, it's a very, very effective drug. It, you can, with a little bit of hope, you can produce a great deal of effort out of a human being. It's really, you know what I mean? It, it, a little bit gives you a huge explosion so from a performance standpoint, it's a very powerful lever to pull and a tricky one. What is hope? How do you define it neurobiologically? How do you cultivate it? I believe that in all these things, grit, hope, all these kind of characteristics that we're trying to solve, there's, there's two steps to it. There's the thing happening in your life and then there's the you believing that the thing is real and actually trusting it. And the, for example, with grit, we'll come back to hope in a second, but grit, there's two steps to get it becoming gritty. First, you have to go into the gym and put in those extra reps and actually be gritty. The second thing is you have to do it so many times in a row that you actually start to believe you're that gritty. So it's an auto, so you've automatized that grit response and then you actually are that gritty, but that belief is the last step. Hope is the same thing, right? So in cultivating hope, I think you got to, I always believe in starting really, really, really small. 
Hope is nothing more than a little, you know, how do I think you actually cultivate hope? You write a clear goals checklist for your day with most of your goals being process goals that you can be in control of and you cross them off when you get through them. Because when you cross them off, you get a tiny little bit of dopamine and a tiny little bit of dopamine. You start moving this into another. This is the foundational reward chemical. This is also the part of the cocktail underneath hope. And this is what we talk about as momentum, right? If you can sustain that for enough days in a row, just the process goals and the achievement of the process goals. Because some days you're gonna have your outcome goals, some days you're not, right? Like there's some days you can't control, some days you can. But if the process goals keep getting ticked off two weeks in a row, three weeks in a row, a month in a row, six weeks in a row, that's actually how I think we start cultivating real hope. Hope that's actually built on something that is reliable, is repeatable, is, is authentic. And I think for those of us possibly wired like me with a very, very, very high built-in sort of bullshit detector for things, I, I can't con myself into hope, right? It's gotta be based on, on real stuff in the real world. I'm not somebody who can use affirmations that aren't based on something that I believe is attainable. If you're wired at all like that, this is a very effective way. And I don't think there's a better way. I think, you know, there's a religion, I can't remember if it's Christian or Jewish, um, hope without works is dead. And I think that's very true. Nice, yeah, that makes a ton of sense. Um, Stephen, you mentioned process goals, outcome goals, the checklist. Can we touch a little bit on what you would recommend people do at a practical level to set goals for the coming year? Because I'm assuming a lot of people have been doing that. A lot of people are probably still going to be focusing on doing that. So breakdown, I think, would be really helpful of how to set goals for the next year ahead. So I think the place to start is with where the science starts. And obviously, there's a whole there's a, there's a bunch of things that you may want to do first. You, you may want to really, really sort of do some work around motivation before you get to goal setting. Um, the point is motivation is what gets you in the game. Goals tell you where you're trying to go. And that's very much how the biology works. And so that's where Art Impossible starts. But let's say we're already there and we're working on, on, on actual goals. The science shows that three minimum of three levels of goals is what we want. We want the mission level goals for your life. I don't think there's any hard and fast law that says you got to have three. You know what I mean? I am... Uh, a little ADHD, I need a lot of stimulation, three is enough, right? And I can't handle four, right? There's not, when I look at these, I try to advance every one of those every day. So every one of those goals will at least get a minimum of an hour of my time every day for sure. Never mind whatever else I got to do. So that's also a number I could work with, right? At a, at a practical level. So you need a mission level statement for your life. What I talk about is a massively transformative purpose. Then you need high hard goals. So one of my mission level goals was to write books that have a, have a deep impact. So high hard goals, get a degree in creative writing, get a job as a journalist on a newspaper or a magazine so I could learn to write and write under deadline and write in different ways and about different subjects. You know, train up my weak spots in my writing, write a book about blah, blah, blah. These are all high hard goals. They're one to five year goals that feed into your massively transformative purpose. So you want everything pointed in the same direction, right? You see, then you've got your high, hard goals, and then you need your daily to-do list. These are clear goals, and we can talk about what clear goals are, but there's a specific way you set them. There's a specific kind of number you want to aim for, though everybody's is different. We can talk about how to calculate that, and there's a specific way to kind of tick them off over the course of the day. But those are the three big categories, and I think the most important thing you can be at each level is as deliberate and clear as possible. And I think as pithy and short as possible, right? I think it's very useful if your mission statement goals, you know, are things you can immediately bring to mind and you know exactly what they mean to you, right? So you know exactly what you're steering towards. Same thing with high hard goals, right? Don't write, I want to write, I write, want to write a book on cooking right? I want to write a book on northern cooking, northern Italian cuisine on prehistoric Stone Age cookware or whatever it is, right? As specific as possible. And the clear goals that you do list 
for your daily goals, same clarity, clear goals. The emphasis has to it's on the clear, not on the goals. The clarity is really important. You need to know what do I focus on? What do I focus on next? Right. When I my clear goals for daily writing, I specify how many words I want to write and how I want my reader to feel. So today I want to write a thousand words in my new book. And when I'm done, I want the re I want them to make my reader feel excited or scared or ready to throw themselves out a window or maybe all three. <laughs> so, so you, Steve, you mentioned three stat, three sets of goals there. Just want to make sure everyone's got it. So we got our we got our mission level goals, massively transformative purpose, high hard goals, and then clear goals, which are happening at a at a more daily level. How do you recommend people set those kind of mission level goals? Well, the follow the passion recipe, which is where the art impossible starts, and turn curiosity into passion, turn passion into purpose. And that's how you, that, that's where you would start with your massively transformative purpose. And that blueprint is really laid out in the art and boss. We could cover it now, but we're going to spend the next hour covering the details. But the biology of motivation is such that curiosity is the basic fuel of motivation. It is designed to be built into passion in kind of a specific way. And that is just being designed to be built into purpose, right? All that purpose is, is your passion attached to a cause that's greater than yourself. And it's worth also pointing out, by the way, that from a goal setting perspective, a lot of people, especially today, are really hungry. What is my passion? What is my purpose? I want it, I want it so bad. And Art Impossible talks about this at length, but it's just worth talking about out loud. Don't rush into this. You know, there are a lot of times in peak performance, we say this over and over again, I think the Flow Research Club, if you've heard me say it, you've heard Rian say it, probably heard Brent say it, you have to go slow to go fast in peak performance in a lot of places. This is really one of those places. You don't want to sort of be two years into your purpose only to discover, oh, it's just a phase. That is so demotivating, you're literally gonna have to back up. So, you know, what your, every fiber of your body may say, oh, I'll give myself a month to get to this answer don't give yourself the luxury here of two months three months four months so in, in the art impossible we talk about playing around at the intersection of multiple curiosities and playing around with places where your passion might intersect your purpose playing around meaning doing inquiries deep dives attending lectures learning more talking about it etc cetera, etc cetera. make sure it's a great great fit make sure it's staying with you over time if every time you return to a core purpose like a core subject it's kindling new fires new questions new curiosities if it's always feeding on itself now you know you're really cooking mm. and don't trust don't never write the what does their t-shirt say never trust the dopamine at the beginning of goal setting right actually setting goals creates dopamine in your system it fires you up this is our biology working for us this is how it's designed to work the body likes it we get a lot of dopamine and we get a lot of dopamine early on in this experience that dopamine is exciting it's fun it's meant to get you into the game it's meant to make it game really sticky don't trust it entirely right because you're going to get this big high and you're going to think when that big high goes away, oh, I've lost the passion. It's no longer there. No, that big high wasn't the passion. And the fact that it's no longer there isn't indicative of anything. Passion is something that's cultivated slowly over time and built into purpose. And trying to rush it as much as we all want to get there sooner, it just doesn't work. Our biology isn't designed to work that way. Once we get there, we will start accelerating massively. And it, so, it, you know, it's worth doing the work to get there, of course, but it's also worth doing the work slowly to make sure you, you end up at the right place. Stephen, you talk about in Art of the Impossible, the seven uh, neural networks related to drive, and you, you particularly do an excellent job speaking about the, the role of the player social engagement network and the seeking system network. I'm wondering if maybe you can maybe ar articulate a little bit more the, the value of uh, activating those those neural networks and how it's related to accomplishing our goals. Perfect. Um, so uh, what Brett was talking about originates with the work of uh, Dr. Jacques Poncept, who uh, was a brilliant neuroscientist uh, up in Washington, who 
is the person who he was sort of a hero, both to me as a neuroscientist and a, and a huge hero to anybody in the animal welfare world, because he was the guy who proved once and for all that animals have emotions. And he did this by mapping the seven foundational emotional systems. We have seven basic emotional systems that are present in all mammals. They're networks and they rely on different parts of the brain. They tend to use different neurotransmitters and different hormones. And they tend to, you know, one is we have a, a grief panic network. We have a care nurturance network. We have a lust network. We have, and so when we're talking about peak performance, predominantly you're talking about the play, social bonding, uh, morality networks, and uh, the seeking system, right? Seeking system is a general purpose, go out, get resources, uh, seeking system and play. So the reason it's it's play and social bonding and morality is so when you we used to believe a long time ago that uh, the point of play was, oh, we're going to play fight today as an animal. If you're an ethologist studying animal behavior and looking at chimps, baby chimps are fighting. What are they doing? Or, you know, dogs are wrestling. What are they doing? The thinking was for a long time, oh, they're practicing fighting today because tomorrow it's going to be real fighting. And not so much. Uh, and the reason that by the, I can go into how they figured it out, but basically a guy named Mark Beckoff watched animals who played a lot and fought a lot as a kid and said, do they, are they the best fighters as adults? Like did the skills actually translate into real world anything? And did those uh, first did this with wolves and people and a lot of other species. And the answer is no. What actual play is about is communication of, culture and social value. So like when you're a little kid and you're playing with your baby brother and mom says, might does not make right, don't beat up on your baby brother. That's the point of play. It's instruction in morality. It's instruction that might doesn't make right. And we take care of the weaker members of society and blah, 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 all that stuff. That's actually what's being transmitted in play. And underneath that transmission, every time we do something right, of course, there's powerful reward chemicals. When it comes to play, you get a little bit of dopamine and you get a little bit of oxytocin. Sometimes you get endorphins. Um, these are all you know, performance enhancing pleasure drugs. And with the seeking system, predominantly dopamine and norepinephrine, again, pleasure drugs. And so when you're talking about most things in peak performance and you're definitely talking about goal setting, when you're talking about curiosity and passion, you're talking about norepinephrine and dopamine predominantly. And then when you're talking about turning passion into purpose, oh, purpose involves other people. So now you get to start getting social bonding chemicals as well. And it's also worth pointing out that while a lot of people, this is the other reason I don't like talking about mission level goals out loud because it sounds all high-minded and altruistic. I'm here to make the world a better place for animals. Oh, I love you, Stephen, right? And the truth of the matter is, by wanting to make the world a better place for the animals, I'm getting much more reward neurochemistry because I'm not just meeting my needs, I'm also meeting my tribe, my planet, my species, right? And I'm getting rewarded for this. And from a performance standpoint, more neurochemistry, more drugs, better performance, better productivity, better motivation, better fire, better excitement, better focus. And as a result, it's a totally selfish equation. So every time you run around and you say, oh, I'm here to cure the world hunger, I think, no, you're not. You're here to get more dopamine and oxytocin, <laughs> and we'll see if you're going to cure world hunger, right? Like real bad boys move in silence. So when you feed the world, okay, then we talk. But until then, all you're doing is just grabbing neurochemistry at my expense. Well, Stephen, you know, it's good. You can balance off the, your love for animals with how much you say you despise humans. So it's okay that you bring that up, right? I don't despise humans. It's just like sometimes there are better things on television. <laughs> Fair so next question I've got, Stephen, is how, how big should you make your goals and how big is too big? You were talking about hope earlier and, and kind of, you know, the risk of almost like delusional hope said the same sort of thing with affirmations that the issue is that there needs to be some sort of validation of affirmations being true for them to be beneficial. So at what point are goals just too big or delusional? Let me start by saying, I don't think 
the science is, I don't think the science is all the way in on this one. I think we were somewhere like 80% in terms of what we know. I don't think anything's going to get massively overturned by this. And the reason I say that is the banister effect, right? The, the idea that I write about Rise of Superman, that you sort of have to believe the impossible is possible for you before it becomes possible. Uh, one way or another, that, you know, just what we know about human biology is nothing shows up just at the extreme of one thing. Like this is only true for the impossible, right? No, it's a spectrum. It's also true. It's true for the impossible. It is probably true for every goal we set. Meaning, you know, even with money goals, right? Like if you're setting money goals for yourself and I was just doing it with this, with a friend of mine. And I said, look, they wanted to make more money in a given month. And I was like, well, how much, what's the most money you've ever made in a month? And they gave me the number and I was like, okay, you should, that's a realistic goal. Then start there as the, cause you already know that's possible. You can already believe it. You don't. And the reason the belief matters so much is it tilts perspective, right? You notice more things. There's more novelty sort of gets past the brain's filters and more opportunity gets past the brain's filters. That's, you know, sort of the point of some of this. Um, but I think you, with mission level goals, I want to make the world a better place for animals is a process goal, right? It's not an outcome goal. I'm not saying, um, I, you know, I, I was an outcome goal. I can say I want to establish a mega linkage, I, right, in North America uh, to protect wildlife. That to me, I don't actually know. That would be the goal. I would love to do that. But I don't know if I can actually do that. I don't know if I can accomplish that. That might be too big of an impossible, but I know I can make the world a better place for animals and I know I can do it today and tomorrow and the next, you know what I mean? I know what is required of me also with that. So I think with mission level goals, I think you have to believe you can do that, right? They have to sort of be within the realm, some realm of possibility for yourself. You also have to know how to act on them, how to make them actionable for yourself is often how I think about it. And with high, hard goals, you know, I want to set high, hard goals that scare the pants off me because I, that, that, that is sort of useful for me. Cause I like, I like that if you're not as, as risk friendly as, as me, don't do that to yourself. But, um, I like high, hard goals that scare the pants off me, but I also know are obtainable. You know what I mean? I want to write a book on a subject I, I might not know anything about, but, I know how to learn. I know, you know, I know it, it could take 10 years to get there, but you know, that sort of thing. And I, um, I also have no problem. You know, I have high hard goals that are, well, I want to accomplish this in the next one to three years. And then I've got high hard goals are sometime over the course of my lifetime. I want to do this. And I, you know, they're, they're different. And I think with the same thing with clear goals, right? Like you don't, you're setting clear goals and, you know, do your daily to do list. I always say, to, for a daily to-do list, figure out how many things you can be an excellent at it in a day. And that's how many things you're going to put on your list. And, you know, it differs every day to your energy level. You're going to wake up at a different spot. There's going to be a different number that's possible. But, you know, for me, it's about nine things. And if it, and when I say how many things in a day can you be excellent at, I don't just mean like the stuff you have to do for work. I mean anything you're going to do that's going to take energy, Right, because that's really going to suck calories out of you. So it could be a difficult conversation with a spouse or a friend. It could be, you know, if you have to hike your dog and it's going to be a big hike, it's going to take energy. Going to the gym, all those, anything that's going to pull energy, right? Meaning the next thing you're coming to on your to-do list, you're going to have less in the tank for, should go on your to-do list. But again, all those things you should believe you know, they should be stretch goals a little bit. You want to stretch out your comfort zone with everything you, you sort of do. So you're always pushing yourself a little, but totally attainable and believable. And, you know, this is, uh, yeah, we'll stop there. Right on, Stephen. I'm, I'm curious in times like this where there's so much uncertainty, how do you support individuals or how do you yourself think about writing goals where there's, you know, it feels like the future is so unknown and unpredictable and, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just curious, in times of uncertainty, how do you optimize that to, to support the goal setting process? So it's interesting. Brent, you, this is going to be really familiar to you. And this may not, I don't know if this particular thing is covered in Art Impossible either. So goal setting is a key component in resilience. Mm -hmm. One of the, right, one of the ways, I'll give you an example from my own life. Um, so I worked basically seven years nonstop to get to last March, 
right? I had a plan. My family was living in New Mexico. I needed to get us out of there and move the sanctuary, move the house, do a whole bunch of stuff. It took about seven years. And I literally worked almost seven years nonstop, had some breaks along the way, but not anything. And I was going to get to last March. And I literally, as you know, was going to ski March, April, May, you know, and then, you know, March happened and uh, COVID arrived. They closed the ski resorts. And I, you know, like everybody else, I had to, you know, we all had to hustle and figure it out and everything else and et cetera. And, um, but not being, it, it seems like a small thing, but when you literally say, okay, I got to work for seven years and I got to take a break here and that break doesn't show up. And the thing you've been motivating yourself with is gone. Um, it was hard for me. It was odd. I mean, I like, I, but I, by like er, mar, mid eight, mid March, it was very, very clear to me that, um, this, I was waking up every day pissed off about not being able to take time off and take a break and ski. And I was like, wow, it's getting this, the skiing, this thing, my obsession with this thing is getting in the way of everything else I'm doing. Mm. I have to, and I was like, well, what would make it okay? And I was like, okay, what would make it okay is if I entered next year's ski season, meaning right now, a better skier than I ended last season. Right. Even if I by ski season was taken from me, if I actually managed to accumulate the progression that I right, And I so I came up with a crazy plan for how to do that, that, you know, included like <laughs> every time I took my dogs out for a hike, I was doing it in a 30 pound weight vest and we were going up mountains. And I right, So my I got in. I added 350 pounds to my leg press over the course of the summer. I learned how to rail slide. I, we built rails on dirt in my backyard and in the mountains behind my house. And if you've ever fallen on dirt before, it's awful. It's not a good thing, but we put on full on like downhill mountain bike gear and I learned to <laughs> rail slide on dirt. It hurt a lot. Um, and then I took a giant road trip up to Mount Hood and spent uh, three days skiing with the pros up there. Um, and that was, and you know, et cetera, et cetera. And the, I literally entered ski season stronger and a better ski than I like. I can do things on skis today, you know, a couple weeks, a couple months into ski season that I could not do at all in the, the last season because that was the goal. So that's in terms of how do you set goals in terms of COVID and challenges and things like that, figure out like, all the pain and say, okay, what makes this okay? six months from now, once the world's vaccinated and life starts again, or however you want to think about it, that's one thing. And these might be, this is sort of a, you know, a medium high hard goal. It's a, it's a year out. It's that kind of, that kind of, you know, not super long-term goal, but that's how I thought about it. And by the way, those are, I'm still setting those kinds of goals. I was, um, I, I like the idea of building resilience into goal setting a little bit. I think, you know, I, we talk a lot about in Art of Impossible stacking practices, right? Don't peak performers are too busy to solve problems one at a time. Everybody I know who's going after impossible, high, hard goals. It's hard to do. It's exhausting and it's difficult. All a lot of it. So you want if you're going to reach for a tool goal setting and whatever it is, you want it to be solving multiple problems. In, um, at once, well, all the tools in Art Impossible are sort of designed to do that. Everything we do at the Flow Research Collective is sort of built around these ideas because we work with the best of the best, and they're busy people, so they don't. There's not a ton of time to do that. You want practices that solve multiple things at once. I can definitely vouch, Stephen, for the the seven or so years worked straight. That's for sure. <laughs> four four years into working with you, I kind of started wondering <laughs> when, when does the vacation happen. <laughs> Still hasn't, by the way. But anyway, um, <laughs> I know. I know. <laughs> uh, so, Steve, how how often do you recommend people review their goals? Simple question, but uh, and maybe also just to add a little bit more interest to that question, it, does that practice of reviewing goals in any way relate to either pattern recognition or the goal directed system? I think both. Right. I I, I actually think both. Um, I don't review goals until my goals are accomplished because I like I have a rule for myself with everything I do. Right. If I say it out loud, it's a contract. If it goes on a to do list, it's going to get done. I literally like it's not. So I don't. This is a nonsensical question to me. 
Like, when do you want to review your goals? After your goals are accomplished, then set some new ones. You shouldn't, like, the, 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 don't goal set. Not a, Nothing is worse for performance over time than not reaching your goals. Hmm. Well, one of the reasons why you want to set process goals and not outcome goals, but, like, the point is you want, that's real momentum. So, like, that stuff doesn't, like, nothing comes off my goal list until it's done. Then I review the goals. And what about, um, I just, let's just say then awareness of goals with respect to either passion, or uh, sorry, pattern rececognition or the goal directed system. I know one of the quotes that David Eagleman, the Stanford neuroscientist has in incognito is that, uh, the conscious mind sets goals, the unconscious mind achieves goals. Mm -hmm. So maybe you can, I don't know, un unpack that a little bit. Oh, um, well, so this is a whole bunch of this stuff. What do we mean by the human brain as a goal directed system? And what do we mean by the conscious mindset goals and the unconscious, right? What does all that mean? You got to start with the fact that the brain takes in externally a tremendous amount of data every second. It's about 11 billion bits of information per second. If you go on with Marvin Zimmerman's calculations and, and he was the, I think he's the last one to count it up. Some people differ on this. Our awareness, what makes it the conscious awareness, depending on whose numbers you're going with, 2000 is the maximum I've heard. Chick set me high, believed it was about 160, uh, I think, bits per second that we could process. The point is consciousness, the bandwidth that we actually experience as reality is a very limited bit of data. So what the hell gets through the filters, right? Like the first order of business of the brain is how do I take 11 billion bits of information, condense it down into 2000 bits in a way that's useful. And can fulfill my evolutionary needs and the two big filters are my fears and my goals that's what filters reality fears tend to be more a little more stronger they tend to because survival you know negative stuff that could possibly threaten your life is a little more important than the stuff you're going for to survival we're a little bit biased negatively this is one of the reasons optimism is so important because it lets in more of the goals and this is the whole reason why does mindfulness matter why do gratitude practices work all the kind of what we talk about as the positive psychology basics that are literally designed to make you happier and more optimistic why does that matter from a performance perspective just forget the emotional side it matters because less fear more new information more Right. And if goals are what are filtering reality, then what that new information is, is stuff that can help you achieve your goals. So if you don't have proper goals, your brain can't filter reality. So it can't t get you the stuff that's going to help you achieve those goals. And um, I'll give you let, let me give a crazy example from my own life that came out of a con. I don't know if you Rihanna, you're going to remember this conversation. We were having a um, we were having a discussion about if we could build any lab possible for the Flow Research Collective. Like, what will we build? And I was like, well, we would clearly build Kelly Slater's Wave Pool with the best neural lab in the universe attached to it. I mean, duh, of course, that's what we did. <laughs> and we were talking about this on a Wednesday. And I was like, you know what? If we ever make billions of dollars, that's what we're going to do. We were laughing about it and talking about it. And I, I, we hung up the phone. And I, I was like, I wonder if it is billions of dollars. And I got on that. It turns out it's $200 million. That's what Kelly paid for his wave pool. And I, that's what I looked at on a Wednesday. I went, oh, $200 million. I don't, that's a lot of money. I don't, I have no, we don't have $200 million. I don't even know what, I, I don't even want to raise $200 million. What a pain in the ass. And I just put it away. I didn't even think about it. But I was like, that'd be really fun. I like it. And I didn't think about it. Didn't think about it. Sunday, I was sitting, I don't even remember what I was reading, but I, was reading something, I looked up into the distance and I saw, basically I saw into the Native American reservation, the Washoe reservation that's out past my house. And so then my brain went, wow, they're doing all kinds of really interesting development out there and they're looking for really, I wonder if they, they've got lots of land. And I was like, they have land for a wave pool. And my brain just started going, oh, wait a minute, that's a public private partnership. And wait a minute, that $200,000 rate pool was for four waves and we would only need two so we could cut that cost. By the time I was done Sunday afternoon, my brain had managed to like get the price tag down to like 
20 million dollars which is a crazy amount of money but that's an amount of money i could raise like mm-hmm. kelly slater's ray pool with uh, a bunch of fmri machines attached to it right there's probably one or two people who are on the call right now who would go okay that sounds interesting i might fund that right suddenly it's a possibility i went from this is totally crazy and ridiculous to oh wow this is these are some actual action steps i could take to doing something that was absolutely crazy and nonsensical on wednesday that's what i mean by filtering reality right without that possibility on wednesday my brain never sort of looks up takes the pattern recognition of the wave pool and the neural lab and sees the washer reservation and connects those dots Right. Maybe it's not the washer reservation that ends up being the the final partner. But even the idea of bringing in that kind of partner. Right. Is what came from that moment. And it unlocked a lot. And this is just how everything happens. And the simple example that we all know about is we've all driven down this that street a million times and not seen the restaurants. And then one day you drive down the street and you're hungry. Something like, oh, crap, the street I drive every day is lined with restaurants. Who knew? Tibetans over there and Mexicans over there, right? I mean, like, we've all had that experience because suddenly you're hungry. Your brain has a goal. Feed me. It filters reality and it shows it to you. That works at every scale. So that's what we're talking about when we talk about pattern recognition, right? Your brain is recognizing hunger and restaurant and putting the two together and filtering reality so it shows you the restaurant where before you were driving down the street trying to get to your next meeting, you weren't seeing the restaurant, you were seeing the cars and the gap in the car that you could dart into, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. It's a great, great example of, of just the need to think big as a first step. And you know the fact that kind of setting goals that are beyond or require more than your current capabilities is so important because you've developed those en route. So Stephen, when I think about goal setting, I think about it's a process of, uh, kind of telling yourself who you are and what you're prepared to do to to actualize that. And, and so I kind of think of it almost as if um, one is writing a script to actualize this character, or this sense of self of who they are. And obviously the MTP is focused. So this is our developing a massive transformative purpose we've spoken about. It's about organizing that goal or that story around fulfilling or answering that ultimate concern that we have for life that we're trying to to solve or that challenge or that problem. Um, So Maslow spoke a lot about wanting to, you know, really organize our goals around becoming a whole person and looking towards fulfilling those growth needs. So whether it's creativity or adventure or love or purpose and really trying to steer away from getting caught up in those uh, security needs of trying to just fulfill our goals to get power or money or popularity or esteem. So I'm just curious, do you have any personal stories about seeing how people have been thwarted off from that ultimate concern and and unnecessarily maybe strove towards those security needs or popularity? And yeah, I'm just curious how you've managed that yourself. I like the idea of the story as goals as part of the story you tell about yourself. That's an interesting, it's a really smart way of talking about that. Um, So thanks for adding that. What we know about extrinsic motivators, money, sex, fame, et cetera, et cetera, um, and and from Daniel Kahneman's work is that as performance motivators, they're most effective until basic safety and security needs are met and you have a little bit left over discretionary income. And once those extrinsic needs are met at that level, um, if you're really interested in performance benefits, intrinsic goals are next. Now, what I don't think anybody's looked at yet is I think there's a certain point at which you've sort of hit your intrinsic goals, meaning like you're, the, you're, the, you're doing things that you're curious about that aligns with passion and purpose and you have the autonomy and you have the mastery. And I think maybe then extrinsic ones may come back online again uh, mm-hmm. in a little more powerfully. And I don't know if that one is entirely solved yet. On a personal level, what I have found is that you can't, like you have to, safety and security, you gotta be able to pay your rent. You gotta be safe and secure and you you, you can't, I mean, there are people who can renounce wealth, renounce everything and set spiritual goals. And maybe that will work for, for certain people, but as a general rule, that, that matters. And cause the anxiety of not being able to meet your needs is just too great. Um, but once you're there, I, I just don't think you can control it enough. You know what I mean? Like with goal setting, 
I know if my goal is to advance flow science and research, right? Flow science and trading, I can meet that goal, mm -hmm. right? And I know that I, it will, you know, it will produce the, the other, the extrinsic stuff, but I don't know when. And these are lessons sort of I learned very much the hard, you know, one of the things with books, for example, that's really difficult early on in a writer's career is books don't really have a full impact in the world for about six years because people have to read them. And it takes a long time for enough people to really have read a book for it to really start doing anything in the world. So even if you write a book that you want to impact the world, by the time that impact shows up, you were on to so many other things, right? If I write a book a year and we're going to say Art Impossible is not going to have its full impact till 2026, 2027, I'm going to write at least three, if not four or five more books between now and then. And mm -hmm. I'm going to be right. So I can't, if, if there was some outcome thing that I was waiting around, you know what I mean? I'd be here forever. It wouldn't work as a motivational tool. And mm -hmm. so to me, the whole point of goals is it's about clarity. So I know my brain knows what I'm pointing at and I'm looking for goals that are always motivating me. Right. So I don't want to set goals where, you know, mm -hmm. for example, last year, faster, the last book I wrote, um, which like if there was ever a book that was designed for the bestseller list, it was faster, right? And everything about that book was aimed that way. And then it turns out that we launched the book on the day that COVID arrived, right? We were in New York, in the studios, and that like literally the two big stories that morning were, hey, there's this weird virus in China and Stephen and Peter have a new book. And Steve and Peter were being asked about this COVID thing. And we're looking at each other. They were like, uh-oh, <laughs> I think we got a problem, <laughs> right? That is, that stuff is, life is going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, and it's tempting to set outcome goals a lot earlier in, when you're younger and you're, you're a lot, more, you're hungrier, right? But you get kicked around and you start to, like, everything that's ever gone on a goal list of mind, I've achieved. The, the wealth, the fame, like all that, like the, those things that, I, you know, that you might have wanted along the way, they showed up, but they showed up as a result of doing the work, right? Mm -hmm. My job is the work. My goals are around the work. The work <laughs> and my ability to do the work is what I can control. All the other stuff, and especially if like fame, that's not your choice. That's mm -hmm. other people's choice, yeah. right? That's the whole point of fame. It's not like as much as you might want it, it has almost nothing to do with you. It's about other people. And, you know, whether or not other people want to like me enough or not like me enough to be this thing called, like, that sounds like a loser's bet of a goal to me. Like, wow, that sounds like a good way to get your heart broken. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So common sense tells me not to set that goal. <laughs> Would you say that's similar to kind of uh, Victor Frankl's uh, proposition that, uh, happiness is an unintended side effect of living a meaningful life or somewhat aligned with that. So don't actually seek for happiness or don't seek for fame, but let it be the unintended side effect of you being committed to your craft, so to speak. Or I think that's very true. I Like, you know, Stuart Brand once said the only sustainable long-term happiness is the satisfaction of a job well done. And I think there's a lot of wisdom in that statement. And what I mean by that is if you're aiming for the, like the happiness, how do I feel right here, right now? Dan Harris wasn't wrong, right? We get to be about 10% happier, right? Because of the way emotional set points are wired. Yes. Over very long periods of time, if you live a very high flow lifestyle, it may, you may be able to extend your the upper limit of your emotional set point, but I'm not so sure about that in all honesty, and when it comes to actual happy, sad. The good news here, the crazy thing about this, this is not about goal setting, but I, I do want to point this out because it plays into it. If you have made it into adulthood, what the research is very clear on is you've already felt the worst that life possibly can give you. There might be a level of a pain threshold, right? Maybe you've only gone to seven and not a nine on the pain scale, broken bone wise or whatever. But because of emotional set points, unless you experience the death of a child or chronic unemployment, you've already felt 
as bad as you're going to feel on this planet. Maybe it's not as sustained, right? Maybe you'll feel that bad today, tomorrow, but you've already actually probably suffered through it. So setting a high, hard, impossible goal for yourself and thinking, oh God, that I like, I don't know if I can bear it to go. You've already borne it. I just like to point that out. You're already tough enough to take it. Um, if you've made it into adult, if you've gone through your teenage years, especially because teenage years, we have no emotional control and our hormones are way up and our feelings are super magnified. Right. And we haven't yet learned any of the skills that say, hey, your feelings are not always right. They're not always true. The voice in your head sometimes lies to you. All that stuff that sort of comes with adulthood. You don't have as a teenager. You have probably felt at, like so don't think when setting high hard goals that, oh my God, I'm going to set this thing and I don't know if I can take the, like what it's, it's required. I want to point out that you've probably already been able to take it. So there's an interesting kind of point here in the comments. He says, I don't know if I'm just a bad person, but I feel like the more my goal benefits others, the less driven I have to go after it. I have to pack it in a selfish way to make it work. Um, so so what yeah, you- let me, by the, yeah, by the way, let's talk about that because really good point. <laughs> Really good point, in my opinion. Let's be clear on a couple of things. I want to write goal books that have a deep impact in the world. That sounds really selfless. No, I want to have a deep impact in the world because it means I'm going to get paid to write another book. That's about me getting paid to write the next one and me being a creative. I want to advance flow science and research and training. You might think that's about other people. It has nothing to do with other people. I literally love the problem solving. I'm not in flow for other people. Everybody else in this company is in flow for what it can do for you guys. I'm in flow for the puzzle, man. I like the intellectual puzzle. Y'all on your own. <laughs> no, I mean, you know, it, the, thing I, the thing that's about the world is I want to make the world a better place for animals. That's, and because I really do, I really love animals. I really hate it when animals suffer. I will go really freaking far out of my way to help an animal that's suffering, right? I am totally like, it is a natural extension of who I am, that purpose. So yeah, don't think that your mission level goals, like I got one that's about the world. The other two that are about Steven. And, you know, the deep impact on the world is much more about me getting to write the next book. And, you know, the fact that a a creative always has to have their next creative project or they go crazy and I'm trying to stay sane. That's what all that is about. So, yeah, I good point and and really true. And by the way, if you are maybe you're so much more empathetic and selfless and like motivated like that way, you know, than I am. Cool. Set your goals that way. I'm just this kind of selfish bastard, so I'm setting my goals this way. <laughs> a good, I think a good way to, to check you know. the reality of the selflessness is to ask yourself, if the thing still happened, but you weren't the one to do it, would you be equally satisfied? And usually the answer is no, which exposes no. the yeah, selfishness exactly. with that kind of thing. So, yeah, and by the um, way, if, if the world could become a better place for animals without me having to do anything, please, I'll sign the form. You can have my arm. <laughs> Afraid. What, see, what big uh, trends or mega trends, maybe from faster or bolder abundance, do you think? Uh, yeah, do you think people should consider in the coming year, especially in relation to, you know, twenty twenty? Uh, yeah. Well, how about in relationship to goal setting? This is just an idea from faster. It's a little bit from abundance as well, but faster. And about all these books are about exponentially accelerating technology that is really allowing us to go after these sort of high, hard mission level goals in ways like we've never been able to do this before. And without going into too much detail on exponential technology, this is everything from computers to nanotechnology, sensors, networks, quantum computing, artificial intelligence, solar, et cetera, et cetera. But the big point is not just that these technologies are accelerating, they're coming online, it's that they have user-friendly interfaces, meaning anybody can take advantage of them. You don't have to be an expert to play. That's what a user-friendly interface allows us. And the, the great example that I like to give is quantum computing. Let's forget what quantum computers actually do. Let's just say crazy sci-fi whiz-bang technology that you know, for 30 years was, was ghost tech and it's suddenly real. And it's not just suddenly real, 
and it is you can go to rigetti.com rigetti is a quantum computer maker they you can download forest for free it is a user interface to their 32 quibit online quantum computer and you can run programs on their quantum computer and over two million programs have been run so this is a user-friendly interface to the quantum computing world that anybody can use that's what i mean by user-friendly interface it unlocks a technology for everybody and so these are the most potent technologies the world has ever seen and when it goes to comes to goal setting they're at your disposal the most powerful technologies the world has ever seen are now all available. I mean, synthetic biology, you want to create genetic life from scratch, you can now do it in your kitchen. All of this stuff is, you know, is real. And so in terms of what is the possibility space of like what could actually happen in my life, it's pretty big. On that note of uh, exponential technologies, the point there is kind of identify those trends or waves and, you know, try and capture them with, the direction your goals are moving you? I think if you're interested in, you're not, you know, if, if you, their exponential technologies are phenomenal things to build businesses on top of, right? Mm -hmm. And um, or to utilize to solve problems. We are, a lot of the things that we're doing, the Flow Research Collective, my goal is to decode the neurobiology of flow. One of the reasons that we can do this is because the combination of artificial intelligence and the sensor revolution means, you know, we have access to supercomputers and we have access to, you know, scientific lab equipment that 20 years ago will cost millions and millions of dollars and is now hundreds of dollars. And so does everybody else. I want to preface this that I've had the pleasure of reading your book. And, and one thing that certainly comes through is that there's this simplicity and uh, this tendency I, I feel your writing is evolving into where you're not trying to ex uh, get people extremely excited and enthusiastic but it's a kind of a no bullshit you know the big point here is the impossible is always a checklist and and I and I, I don't know if you know and even with the empty so evolve is a funny word you used a funny word there and what I mean by is this is this was the least flowy book I've ever written for me at a personal level, this book was really, really hard. And I had to rewrite it five or six different times along the way. It took a very long time. And other than I think the introduction, and maybe a couple of the chapters, there was very little flow to be had. And the, one of the main reasons is my flow as a writer comes from doing things with language and do things with story and doing all that stuff. But this was a how-to book. This is one of these books. This actually was a selfless book for me. I wrote this book for everybody else. Yeah. I did not write the, right? I often say that a lot of this stuff in Art of Impossible, to me, from a, like, what am I interested in neurobiologically and flow? This, is, this stuff is like change the kitty litter, right? That's the level in terms of how I think about something because it's been, like, I've known about goal setting and motivate for 30 years, right? I like, this is really mm -hmm. old, right? That science is new, but the ideas are not, you know what I mean? It's taken a long time. And I really did. This is the only book that I've ever written where I the most useful. How do I make this the most practical? How to explain this so simply that mm -hmm. this is a real how-to manual? And how do I still make it fun and engaging to read? Mm -hmm. I hope it's still fun and engaging to read. I think it is. I think it is. Question here, Stephen Rand. Balancing being goal driven with being outcomes attached. You talked about process oriented goals, but maybe you can touch on on that question more specifically, how to balance being goal oriented whilst simultaneously outcome detached. Simple example from my own life. The outcome goal is I let's you know, I'm under assignment. I want I have to finish a book by June. The art of impossible it has to be done by, you know, July. That's the outcome goal, the done book. That's not what I care about today. What I care about today is advancing the cause 500 words. I want to edit the 500 words I wrote the day before, and I want to advance it 500 more. And the big point is this. I may be more specific in my goal, like saying, oh, I'd like this, these words to make my reader feel excitement or awe or whatever you know emotion I'm sort of going for in the reader. But the thing about it is, it's entirely in my control. I can determine 
very easily. Like 500 words, it's clear, it's measurable, it's right there. I'm either either wrote 500 words or I didn't write 500 words, and it's also totally doable. It's in my control. That's a process goal. It's not. Um, and mind you, I didn't say I write 500 words that makes the reader feel excitement, and I'm going to double check this by having my wife read it so she tells me whether or not she's ex like that would. No, I'm not even going that far. I want something that like where I because what matters ultimately is that you show up and execute. Life is going to be nothing more or less than we make of it. And the way you make of it is by showing up and executing every day, every day and every day. And the amazing thing happens from like it takes a while, even writing books, to believe that 500 words a day is going to add up into an actual done book. You know what I mean? And you can't think about it. You can't think, oh my God, I'm only 1,500 words in and I've got to write 85,000. Like, that's just dumb. I uh, know it's, oh, cool. I got my 500 words done today. What's what, the next thing on my list? Okay, cool. I'm going to get that done. I want to get through this stuff with as little emotion as possible, as little sort of drama and strife. And I want to be able to declare victory over really low hanging fruit, right? 500 words is hard. It's a stretch goal for me. If at the bottom front end of a book, 350 words a day is easy. 500 words, I gotta like, I gotta push a little, but I wanna be able to declare victory. And maybe, because the, by the way, the declaring that victory, that's the dopamine. That's the momentum. That's really right. Like, so it's much less, all the other stuff is less important. That's stuff that takes care of itself. What matters is you show up and you do the thing that's right in front of you. Then you do the next thing. Then you do the next thing. That's how you get to impossible. That's how you get to any high hard goal. I always say this, like, none of this stuff is very sexy, right? Like, when you listen to, like, when you read the art and pause, when you, when you talk about what's actually legitimate peak performance stuff, like, it, none of it's going to get you laid on Friday night. It really won't. Like, if you talk about it in bars, it's not, like, it's just not that stuff. It's not like the cool new whiz-bang technology or the cool new substance, right? It's not that. In fact, one of the things that is so hard for people with the actual real tools of big performance is they're so unsexy, it's almost hard to believe they're going to work, mm -hmm. right? Because they're so sort of dumb. I got to set clear goals. I got to, right? Like, they're so dumb sounding. But the brain, like, it evolved millions and millions of years ago, right? You're dealing with an organ that at a certain level, it, you know, evolved in prehistoric, you know, cave person times. And um, that's what we're playing with. That's what we're optimizing. And so I, I often think that like part of what stands in the way of, of this stuff is one, we want it to work faster than it's designed to work, right? It's designed to be very, very efficient, but you sort of got to do it every day over and over and over. And the results start showing up in months and the really big results show up when you've been doing it for years, I think. And that's when you start to really amaze yourself. That's when you start to get to a life that doesn't just exceed your limitations. It exceeds your expectations. Mm. What, what key lesson or insight within the Art Impossible book took you the longest to learn? The Art Impossible is a book about going big. And one of the, the last lesson that I learned in the book is that not going bad, big, or is not rising to our full potential is actually bad for us. That was the right. That was the most surprising thing. But in stitching all the neurobiology together and just looking at it, I started to realize because um, I'm not an expert in trauma and I'm not an expert in these are not things where I spend a lot of time. Uh, but Heidi Williams, who many of you know, chance chance has some stuff that challenged me on my knowledge of trauma. So I got it under the hood and did some did some reading and I think Brent might have gotten in my face about depression somewhere along somewhere along the line and I decided to learn more, more than I knew. And so I started looking at, at, at these causes and you start to realize that, you know, as the way I explain it is, uh, so let, we'll talk about motivation for a second. There are five big intrinsic motivators. We've talked about them, right? Uh, there's curiosity, passion, purpose, autonomy, and mastery. And by the way, if you get all five of those right, they're all flow triggers, so you get more flow. So there are eight major causes of depression in the world today, and these are well-known and well-established. 
two of them that are the most famous are genetics and um, trauma. And it turns out when you look under the hood, genetics is never 100% responsible for anxiety or depression, right? It's always only 50% of the equation. It's never 100% of the equation. Um, there's very rarely somebody who just can't make enough serotonin. It's I can't make enough serotonin and X, Y, and Z happened kind of thing. And then you look at trauma and the vast majority of the time, trauma doesn't lead to post-traumatic stress disorder or anxiety or any of those things. It leads to post-traumatic growth, right? It's the Hemingway quote, the world takes everyone and afterward many are stronger at the broken places, but it's really many. Like many are stronger at the broken places. Very rarely does it go in the other direction. When you look at the other six causes of depression and anxiety, and mind you, these are the two largest mental health plagues we've ever seen in the history of the universe, right? Somebody's killing themselves once every 12 seconds. One out of 10 adults is going to be depressed or anxious over the next year. This is insane. It's the largest drain on our health care budget. Huge numbers. What are the other six causes? They're literally not using our bio performance biology the way it's been designed to use. Lack of meaningful work is one of the number one causes of depression in the world. What does that really mean? Work that doesn't make me curious, that's not aligned with my passion, that's not aligned with my values, and my purpose, that I don't have the autonomy to pursue in a way that's interesting to me, and doesn't offer the, the opportunity for mastery to get better at the things I want to get better at, and bonus, doesn't produce flow. That's literally under the hood, lack of meaningful work. Lack of meaningful values is another one. What does that mean? It means you didn't bother to turn curiosity into passion and passion into purpose. Like literally not going big is bad for us. And again, I, I like to always point out like none of this shit is new information. Brent brought up Maslow earlier. Maslow said famously, um, whatever a person can be, they must be. And he was saying the exact same thing, right? We are designed to rise to our full potential. We're capable of so much more than we know. And we are designed to stretch towards that capacity. And if we don't do it, we pay the price in literally in, in misery, as far as I can tell. Because it was the stuff that wasn't like, I, my work is zero up to Superman. It's not broken to zero. There's a whole field of psychology and tons of experts in the world who do broken to zero. It's just not right where I where I'm any. I, there's already people are doing that work. I'm not needed. I love that. Going big, going big is bad for you. That's gonna. It's definitely gonna be another T-shirt, by the way. You got a question there, Brent? And I think well, we'll yes. Yeah, I just wanted to acknowledge that um, your willingness to to write a, a, a how-to book, which is obviously not something you you typically would do, is uh, it really models well the your value in, in, in the growth mindset of trying something different and to model and share with all of us that you had the least flow writing this book than other books, but you still accomplished it. It's still here. And, and this is where we are. It's just a great testament to, to your determination and, and what's in the book itself. So I just really I, appreciate I, that. I Look, I, this is the way I always say it. And this may be like way too harsh for most people, but as far as I can tell, it sucks here. A lot of the time, it sucks here. It's hard, it's miserable, it's difficult. It just, it just sucks here. And it turns out, it sucks if you're sitting on your couch, drinking beer, watching NCIS, trying to pretend it doesn't suck, or if you're trying to save the world. Like it actually, it sucks almost just the same, right? Yeah. In fact, I think if you're actually trying to save the world, it sucks a little less, right? I just do. So like sometimes you just do right, like you you just do this because it. I just if if it's gonna suck anyways, why not suck mm -hmm. for a reason, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's it it's just sort of that. I, it doesn't. That's not always true, and I'm not really. You know, I was I was a punk. I was a goth. I I still wear black on the outside because I feel black on the inside, and you know all those things. Maslow has this great quote to build off that. He says, per, uh, perhaps we can define happiness as experiencing real emotions over real problems and, and real tasks. And as you always say, uh, suffering is not an option, Stephen. So again, I just appreciate you staying in the, in the, in the trenches with us all here and, and showing us how it's done. Huge thanks, everyone. Thank you, Brent, a ton for, for co-hosting. Great to have you here as always. And thanks, Stephen, for sharing everything. everything. Yeah. See you, everybody. Bye-bye. If what you've heard on Flow Research Collective Radio has been helpful, 
please consider doing us a solid and leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you are listening to this. Reviews help us connect to a wider audience so we can get these peak performance principles out to more people. Thank you.